I do want to speak a little bit to this. Uh, Evelyn brought up something, and I always like to take this opportunity when we meditate on uh, the baptism of Jesus to point this out, because I know many of you uh, encounter other non-Christian uh, uh, evangelists, particularly the Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, in Spanish, they're called the testigos. You know, they come knocking on your door and they want to sell you magazines and stuff like that. Um, they do not believe in the Trinity. They do not believe that Jesus was God. Um, and so their baptism is invalid. It's important to know. Okay. But one of the places that you can take Jehovah's Witnesses to, to show the evidence of the Trinity is right here in the baptism of Jesus. This is probably one of two places in all of the New Testament that you can take people to, to illustrate why we believe in three persons, one God. Okay? Because it says here, Jesus was baptized, immediately he came from the water, and they saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove on him. Right? So there's Jesus, there's the Holy Spirit, and wait, there is a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Who is that? The Father. The Father. So you have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, all right there in one scene. But there are three different persons. No. You see that? Yes. You mean you're making a choice yourself instead of other people inviting themselves into your body for the Holy Spirit to work in somewhere else. You have a choice on your own to honestly be a believer or not. Well, you understand science is what is undeniable, but you have a choice to be able to provide that. So it's not something if somebody else wants to be here, you don't have that. I'm not sure I understand what you're saying. So go ahead and follow up on this. This is the example of where the whole Trinity can be demonstrated. That there are three separate persons, but one God. It's not three gods. It's one God, but manifested in three separate persons. Three distinct persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The other place that you can go in the scriptures to see this same example of the Trinity is in the book of Acts. So the two places that you can go to to find examples of the Trinity is here. This is Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, 13 through 17. And the other place is in the book of Acts. I believe it's chapter 6, but I'm going to make sure of it. Acts. Yes. Acts chapter 7. And I'm going to be reading at verses 54 through 60. These are probably the two best places in all of Scripture that you can take someone like a Jehovah's Witness or someone who doesn't believe in the Trinity to, to show that there are three persons but only one God. So, this is the stoning of St. Stephen. So, now when they heard these things, they were enraged. They ground their teeth against him, meaning St. Stephen. <coughs> but he, Stephen, was full of the Holy Spirit. You got that? So Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven, and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. So he's full of the Holy Spirit. He sees Jesus sitting at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open." and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they, the Sanhedrin, 
cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed upon him. Then they cast him out, threw him to the ground, and began to stone him. And as they were stoning him, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he knelt down and said, do not hold this sin against him. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. The point is, there is the Holy Spirit inside St. Stephen. He sees Jesus, and next to him, God the Father. So again, three persons, one God. Three persons, one God. Yes? Trinity, though, is one of the, the most difficult of our articles of faith, uh, because amongst Jews, Christians, and Muslims, uh, we're the only group that <coughs> believes that God is in three persons, three distinct and separate persons, all equally God, all equally divine. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We believe this by faith because this is what's been revealed. And though this idea of the Trinity can be found in the Old Testament, several places, it's not fully developed until the revelation of Jesus. And he is the one that fully reveals to us that God has this characteristic of three separate persons. Because here he is at the baptism, and here we again see at the stoning of Stephen. These are examples by which we can get an idea of the three separate personages of God, and yet know there's only one God. Okay, This is the best example that I know of, these two in all of the New Testament. Like I said, you can get hints of it in the Old, but it's not as developed. I would personally say the, the, the most vivid illustration of this would be in Daniel 7, in the Old Testament. Because Daniel 7, you have the vision of the Ancient of Days, and with it is the vision of the Son of Man. And both of these are divine figures because the Son of Man will reign forever and ever. Okay? Now, we as Christians understand this vision that Daniel has as God the Father and God the Son. But this is probably the best example in the whole of Old Testament that gives us an idea that God is more than one person. More, there's more than one person to God. Mm-hmm. 
I'm going to have to cut you off at this point. I think you're missing my point as to what I'm getting to. This is about the idea of the Trinity and what we believe about it and how one can support this by using scriptural evidence. Because one of the things that happens when you meet up with various non-Christian <coughs> groups like the Jehovah's Witnesses, like Mormons, is that they'll say that this idea is nonsensical or it's nowhere in the Bible. And the idea is, no, it's very biblical. It's in the Gospels. So it's in the Gospels, it's in the book of Acts. So this is a very early idea that camp comes about from the church. It's not something that was developed 300 years later. It was defined 300 years later. But the idea of it was there at the time that Jesus was here. He's the one that revealed to us the Father. And he told us he was going to send the Spirit. So these are the elements, if you will, the personages of God. And by doing this, Jesus has revealed to us this intimate relationship with God. Because as you become more intimate with a person, as we are, this is the connection to the Song of Songs. As you become more intimate with a person, what you end up doing is you know more and more about him or her. And this is how God has revealed himself down through the ages in these covenants. You remember the covenants that we talked about? So in the beginning, it was very, if you will, simple. In the beginning, it was very simple. Okay? God revealed himself to the covenant through the covenant with Adam. And the only thing that he promised was that I'm going to send a savior. That was the only promise that God had given. Very simple. As time went on, this covenant became more developed, more detailed, and it encompassed more people. So we went from a couple, to a family, to a tribe, to a nation, to a kingdom, and finally the whole world is embraced in the covenant with God. And this is an element of how God is not only revealing himself to us, but as he does, he's making himself more intimate to us. Because the more he reveals to us, the more we are in relationship to him. So this all goes back to this idea of we are in a love relationship with God. And the more that we get into that love relationship, the more he reveals himself to us. This is part of the reason why one-fourth of the catechism of the church, catechism of the Catholic Church, one-fourth of it is devoted to prayer. One-fourth of the catechism is devoted solely to prayer. Why? Because it's through prayer that we get to know and become more intimate with this God that has come to save us and redeem us. It is through prayer that we are able to become more intimate and more personal in our relationship with God. Because all of this that God has revealed, all of Scripture, and all that, that, that there is, it seems so global, it seems so for everyone. God so loved the world. And He does. I mean, John 3, 16, the most famous verse in the Bible. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes should not perish but have everlasting life. But that's global. Does God care about me? Yes. And part of what we're learning or part of what we are studying in this Song of Songs is that this is a love letter relationship between him and me. It's how God calls me, how God thinks about me. Yes, you can apply the Song of Songs to the church, how God loves the church.